uh, I'm so excited uh, that we today get to hear uh, a story that will preach a sermon, um, a story uh, of Alex and Kayla Martin and their journey and their life. Um, Alex and Kayla have been OG real lifers. Um, these, guys, uh, these guys were gathering with us on Sunday nights before real life ever gathered on Sunday morning. And um, they helped us start the uh, real life students and pretty much had their hand in every ministry that existed. Would you guys just introduce yourselves to us a little bit? Yeah, so I'm Kayla. I am originally from Southern California. Um, I played college uh, softball, and my senior year, I wanted to do something different. I transferred over to UT Martin to finish my last year, then swiped right on Tinder and met this guy, and the rest is history. Yeah, I still had hair when she swiped right. Um, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, met at UT Martin. I'm from Clarksville and grew up going to church here, and then uh, to UT Martin met her. Another kind of God thing, too, we didn't mention how we met was kind of, we were two, two blocks away from each other, had no idea, needed some crazy app like Tinder to meet, but it was all worth it. So good. You guys have had quite the journey uh, with your children, and we just want you to tell us some of your story. I've been preaching through Romans 8, and, um, and we've, big, we've come to the passage that talks about suffering, and um, I thought of you guys as a great model. I know you may not think of yourselves that way, but it's truly inspiring how you've navigated um, some real suffering in your life. Would you tell us about your journey? Yeah. So um, for those of you that don't know, our oldest son, Enzo, um, he is three years old and he has had a lot of suffering going on through these past three years. Um, so it really started when I was pregnant um, with him and at my 20 week ultrasound, they saw that things were just not developing right in his brain. Um, that 75% of his brain had just kind of turned into fluid and only 25% brain matter had actually formed. And at that point, it was really just a numbing feeling and a whirlwind of emotions of what is life going to look like? Because the life that we all like to envision when we're pregnant is something different. And then when you hear a news like this, it, I just didn't really know how to process it at the time. And it wasn't until he was born and started getting a bunch of different diagnoses that it was like really, really hitting us hard. And um, me and Alex both process it a little bit differently. So the first diagnosis that Enzo ever got um, was at about six months old. He received a cortical vision impairment diagnosis, which basically means that the optic nerve that attaches from the brain and then to the eye got disconnected. And so he, his eyes may work perfectly fine, but his brain does not process what his eyes are seeing. So sometimes they say it could be looking through Swiss cheese. Sometimes they say it could be looking through like a kaleidoscope. Um, so that was the first really hard um, diagnosis we got just thinking that like Enzo will never truly see my face or he won't be able to process the world in which we, in which the way we do. Any thoughts on that? Alex, do you remember like when you first were getting uh, the ultrasound and then when he was born and they were telling you this, do you remember how that, how you process that? Oh, absolutely. I think, well, one is our first child too. So I think if you had a previous pregnancy, you have some type of brown layer to Really, no idea. Right? I don't even. Um, not a clue. I, definitely a lot of. At that point, I still think we had a lot of hope because we didn't know, and they were telling us honestly at that time that it wasn't going to be as bad as it turned out to be. When he had his first MRI, when he was actually born, they came back and said, "Okay, actually, this is way worse than we thought it would be in the original ultrasound." Um, so I think then it hit harder when we were in the hospital um, and just trying to understand like what life would look like and you have no idea and you I mean of course coming from a sports background I think every dad dreams of like well I hope to have this big huge athlete that's just a NFL defensive lineman you know <laughs> and like you know and and just that being taken away from you um is the best thing ever in a sense too because then it kind of says like okay what's our purpose here right like do I, is it does he glorify God or not? And that was something to reconcile with that I would say is not easy. Yeah. Um, pride gets in the way of that. But down the road, it gets, it, you start to see God's picture in that. So. You started wrestling, though, with yeah. a lot of feelings, a lot of thoughts, his future, a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you guys continue yeah. to tell us? Yeah. So the second diagnosis when he was seven months old, and then that was that he had quadriplegic cerebral palsy. 
So meaning all four limbs are affected and it's the brain that affects them. So his body may seem perfect, but the way the brain connects to the way his body moves, he hardly has control. His limbs are really, really tight in his arms and we have to do a lot of therapy to loosen up his arms and um, his legs. He can't bear weight on his leg, legs, so he's not walking um, or really moving a whole lot at all. So that was... I felt like the hardest one for me because I had just, I held on to so much hope that maybe it'll just be a slower process and then maybe it is, he'll catch up eventually. And then when we started having these doctors just telling us straight up like, no, that's not what life's going to look like. This is it. This is it. And you, you got to kind of accept it. That was really, really hard. And at that point, I think I really hit a deep pit of sadness and maybe even a little bit of depression. Um, it's really hard because I think with so much going on with Enzo, it was really hard to process how we were feeling because it was constant doctor's appointment, this, this and that and caring for him. But I think looking back now is definitely a little bit depressed in that moment. Um, that was at seven months, seven months old. Yeah. Yes. And then at uh, nine months old, Enzo had his first seizure. Um, and that's when life got really crazy. Um, that I feel like is the worst of his diagnosis. So Enzo has a type of epilepsy that is not treatable with medication. It's called Lennox Gastaut syndrome. So anytime you add a new medication, it's just, you might have a honeymoon phase and then the brain is just gonna rewire and then figure out how to seize anyway. So before his first birthday, had 11 months old, he was on seven different medications and was pretty much unresponsive. The only, I feel like, connection we had was maybe when we were feeding him and he was taking a bottle, um, but there was no emotion, there was no life to him. And at that pit, I just remember getting on my knees and telling me, God, I need something to hold on to. You got to give me something because I am spiraling. Like I know, I know deep in my heart that you are good and you love this child more than I do, but you got to give me something because I am struggling. The seven medications. Why, why, why seven medications? So they just kept adding them on and it differs between doctors. So the doctors at Vanderbilt, they felt that sometimes it's like a combination of medicines that will take away the seizure. So they felt at that time that seven medications would hopefully take away his seizures. Certain medications target certain parts of the mm -hmm. brain. So with Lennox Gastaut, you have all parts of the brain are essentially seizing. So they add on so many medications to try to put like an iron dome mm -hmm. on everything so you don't have as much connectivity. And that's kind of where you get the right. lifelessness too because they, they do work, but they also... They numb the brain. Yeah. So yeah, he may not be having as many seizures, but now his brain's not even responding to each side of each other. So that's why there's like nothing coming out from him. So um, probably at that, at that lowest of low point, we had a appointment with our pediatrician and he had connected us with a colleague of his who lives in Nashville, who we still talk to this very day and have a really close relationship with. Um, she is a scientist. How awesome is that? And she actually healed her own son who was, had a lot of seizures and was born with a brain injury through the use of CBD oil. So it was really scary, but she encouraged me to completely get and so off all medication and just have him on CBD oil. And I felt really good about that in just in my spirit. I knew that was the right move as much as I'm like, all right, I'm going kind of rogue here on this. So I stripped one medication away, one by one, slowly, slowly, slowly. And then by the time he was off all seven medications, within two weeks, he s laughed for the first time. Yes. So that was so emotional for me. And I felt like that was that God wink that I needed so desperately and just made me feel like, okay, we are on the right path. It's going to be hard and it's going to be a roller coaster, yeah. but just cling tight to God. And he's going to keep giving me these winks in my life that are just going to bless me and fill me with so much hope. So seven months in, you get a diagnosis, mm -hmm. 11 months in, he's lifeless and on seven medications. Mm -hmm. How were you guys processing this with the Lord? So I think me and Alex both process it a little bit differently. I kind of how I mentioned is like, I'm, I like to hold on to hope. So I wanted to think that it's going to, there's going to be a miracle. There's going to be a healing, whether it's, I want it to be in this life, but whether, even if it's not, I know God is still good, but I'm just, I wanted to hold on to some kind of hope that there was um, purpose to Enzo's life and that just that he would get relief at some point in time in one way or another. Um, but my weakness, I feel like 
I bottle things in. And so like, I'll be like, nope, got to be strong for Enzo, for my kids, for my husband. And I try to act like I'm finding all the joy in the circumstances and I am, but I, I don't let myself feel. And then all of a sudden I'll just spiral and have this pit of sadness. So when I'm sad, I feel it really, really deeply. I think of things more black and white and I'm very analytically minded. So when I looked up the statistics, of course I did a deep dive on Linux dystocia syndrome and like just that his life he would be lucky to get past 10 years of age 20 would be a uh, unheard of and um so i i don't show it as much but inside i think i i have a, a, t a more like a volcano you know where like i like going to be an output of emotion and like i will have nothing and then boom it explodes and um so I hit it, and another thing that was going on too is that at time I was on staff here at Real Life, and I was thinking I was doing all the right stuff God would want me to do, right? I'm serving in every possible field. I'm waking up and doing load in. I'm doing load out on Friday nights. I'm doing all the stuff and felt good about that, and I was angry with God because I couldn't understand why would you rip me out of that situation? Like, am I not leading kids to Christ at D now? Like, what, what else do you want me to possibly do? Mm. You know, it just it didn't make sense, and it, it took me two years to figure out what he was doing. And what that was was that he was confirming my faith in a way that I don't think I knew that I needed. And God did. And I, and especially here in America where we have such a, we can get so casual with our faith in that we mm -hmm. don't really truly need it, right? Like I don't worry about what I'm going to go eat after this. I know I'm going to have food. I know that I have a shelter in my head. I'm not hiding in a bomb shelter this morning, right? And with that, I think I can start to not rely on God. I don't actually need a God. Um, I don't need a Savior. And Enzo is, first I was upset about it because it was my circumstances, right? Like I don't get to do what I want to do anymore as much. And now I've started to realize three years later that, oh my gosh, man, that was God truly confirming my faith that like, dude, like I've, I've got you. I know you needed this. And it makes you tethered on to the life uh, after this, mm. and the life now. And... This, uh, what you're saying reminds me of Psalm 119, where the psalmist says, and I'm curious, Alex, if, if you're saying this is your experience, the psalmist said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, for I learned your decrees. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, through suffering, that stuff starts to make sense. You know, like without it, it, it it's, it's hard to see. It would have been hard for me to see, because I just, I didn't have any suffering before this, right? I got to do what I got to go do whatever I wanted to do. I got to attain everything I wanted to, to do and accomplish. And that's the thing I'm most thankful for is that it would, it just allowed me to, to actually need hope mm -hmm. and, uh, and truly have to trust God. Something that I can't, I can't fix in, so. That didn't happen immediately. That was over a couple of years. Two years. Two yeah, years. I so appreciate you sharing this. I so appreciate you sharing this because there's people here this morning that are suffering and they do not see any purpose in it. There's people here that are suffering and they're angry with God. There's people here that are suffering and they don't know if they have any hope. So what you just shared was massive word of hope. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. What, what happened next in the journey? You're 11, 11 months. You slowly, kind of on your own, begin to take him off medicine you, you begin to, to use CBD oil, and he laughs. For the first time in his life, you heard your son laugh. Yep. I, I will say something, a quick story that happened yesterday. It was, uh, and this is how far Enzo's come, is Rip, our youngest child, I was sitting there just watching college football laying on the couch, and he comes up and just whacks me in the nose, which makes me go like, oh, you know, and it made Enzo like laugh over yes. there. So he's come all the way to the point of like, he's <laughs> reacting to his brother I love it. his dad, which yeah. is every you know, right. sibling. You know? <laughs> so yeah, I thought that was just a cool little thing yesterday. Kind of, Which just shows how far he's come to where it was like, from that point where he laughed for the first time, it was like, whoa, he has a personality. He thinks things are funny. And so at that point, me and Alex had a really heart to heart conversation about like, I don't think I want to introduce any more medication. I think he's very sensitive to medication. So I would rather Enzo feel every feeling, whether it be pain, whether it be joy, but he's experiencing life to the fullest wow. in his own way, which some may not agree with, but for us, I knew that was going to be the right decision for Enzo. So suffering from that point where he turns one until now he's three years old was just a roller coaster. Um, our day-to-day -day life, 
looks way different than any typical parent. So we, I, I really understand the meaning of being like the hands and feet of Jesus a whole lot differently because I am Enzo's hands and feet. If he is eating, I am holding him. I am eating with him. Um, if he, you know, I obviously he's still in diapers and then anytime we're playing or whatever, I am holding him. I'm putting him in different positions to make sure that everything in therapy, we're getting stronger, we're getting better. So it is a lot physically um, out of us, but man, I will break my back doing anything for that child um, just to see him thrive and live this life to its fullest. On top of that, the anxiety of like, mm-hmm. um, like he throws up a lot in his sleep or if he has a seizure, he might throw up and how many times we've gone in the bedroom the next morning and just thank God because it, he happened to have vomited on his side. And, you know, I mean, he could choke on his own vomit and pass away that night, you know, and it's just a continual, it's an everyday grind of like totally put, like when you lay your head down on the pillow, you have to put your faith in God that he's going to make it through the next day. Mm-hmm. And if he doesn't, then that was God's plan. And that is a hard thing to reconcile, but it's a continually Ever, ever, or, um, revolving door of emotions. How many seizures does he have? I, 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 there's not a typical day, is there? Uh, right. So, this, just take this last week for example, because I was with him. He had three days where he was all smiles, nothing, and then two days where he had uh, three or four seizures, I think. And the seizures usually knock him out. Like he'll maybe he'll vomit or kind of. But he'll usually just kind of get out of it and cranky. So I mean, and there's no. Uh, we've gone crazy trying to figure out the reasons to what causes it because you have no answer to that it just kind of comes and goes and it just make it makes you truly just okay thank you god for this day because yeah. i don't know what tomorrow like i wrote down in my notes of like friday of last week was the worst day ever like it was the worst day for me and enzo was just like crazy we didn't know about his breathing all the stuff and then saturday was the best day ever yeah. like and it was just such a well, you know, it truly makes you, like, thankful for today that I'm not guaranteed today. I'm not guaranteed a seizure-free day today, you know? I don't know that. And um, that's the, just the coolest thing, I think. But This, this past summer, um, I probably went through one of the, the hardest things with Enzo. So we were in the hospital for um, six days straight. We took him to the ER because he was sick, and then he was just never getting over it. And then all of a sudden, he woke up one morning gasping for air and it just looked like his lungs were just working so hard to breathe so we have to stay calm in that situation also while rushing to the hospital we get there they do every test under the sun doing x-rays pumping oxygen down him all to find out that they have no idea what was wrong with him for some reason he had a blockage here in his sinus or face and pumping that nitrous oxide down him somehow was able to make him breathe better. And it allowed us to get through the hospital visit. But then four weeks later, which would have been like three weeks ago today, started acting up his breathing again, which is probably the scariest thing ever um, because he's just never had any breathing issues. And it's just like one more thing on top of everything else. Um, And so we actually went to the, um, went to see a ENT doctor this past Friday who I think every doctor gets a little bit scared of Enzo because they're like, holy crap, this is a big case. And I don't want to tell you anything wrong. So they like to just send us, I think you should go to the ER. I think every doctor should have his hands on him. But as his parent, we don't just want to rush to the hospital because I was just there in June and I've seen what it does to Enzo. They wake him up every two hours. He doesn't get sleep. He has constant seizures because he's not getting sleep. He's not comfortable. All the things. (coughs) So I just... In my gut, I said, this, I know this is just in the right move. Just stay calm. If it doesn't get worse, I want to keep him home. We'll do this outpatient. Well, then we were going to be set up to see a pulmonologist to see what was going on in his lungs. And I'm also about to get on a plane here, which was this past week. I had a work trip to go to. And so I had to ask Alex, like, are you going to be all right if I'm gone for five days? Can you and your parents hold the fort down? Obviously, I'll come back in a heartbeat. But if not, let me have like some peace in my mind so I can be where my feet are at the same time. Um, and then the, the appointment went good. And I'll kind of let you talk about that on the appointment this week and um, how Enzo was like in the worst shape breathing. He was yeah. just like constantly sounded like he was snoring yeah. while he was breathing all day long. Um, yeah, it was, uh, well, it's, it's tough. It, he was breathing awfully, but his mood was the best it mm-hmm. ever is. So he's 
super happy, smiling, giggling all day, and you're just like, I'm so confused whether or not we should even go to the hospital because mm. the doctor's telling you one thing, but Enzo is telling you something different. And then, um, so went to the pulmonologist, he got on this new type of breathing thing that's supposed to reduce the swelling. So he may have this thing where like, you know, when we suck or swallow, we, this little flap in your throat closes and opens. It's a really cool thing. And uh, so his may just kind of get off and it may take in air or something when it's not supposed to. So he got on this new thing and then the last couple days have been a lot better. Like he's been breathing and then yesterday was fantastic. I mean, he was yeah, I felt like I came home to a whole new kid, which is, all right, here we go. We were in a valley, and now we're up on this mm. peak of the roller coaster right now. So, like, right now, it's like, okay, things are good. Thank you, God, you know, for allowing us to be here today. Because, honestly, the way this past week was going, I was like, I don't think we're going to make it Sunday. We might be in the hospital. But praise God, um, I feel like it's one of those things. If God has, like, a message to be shared, he's going to find a way to get that message shared. So praise God that we're able to be here and share this today and glorify him. How have you processed this in the full arc of things? Like, how would you say, I mean, this hasn't been easy. You've had mm. feelings toward God. You've had questions. How have you processed this? Um, I feel like the most that I can relate to on a small scale has been like the heart of Mary. And that's kind of feeling like how I would process things. So like Mary watches Jesus suffer and go through all those hard trials. Whereas like the heart of a mother and any of mothers would say to watch your child suffer is like the worst thing on this earth. Like to just feel like my heart is just being like torn into pieces and I can't help him is the worst thing ever. Um, but I feel like overall I've had like I've had to just hold on to hope. I've had to like kind of going off of, I'm just going to jump to your sermon because I feel like that's kind of like, hold, hold, hold that. that. Okay. Alex, you just gave us a powerful word of hope telling us like how you see God's hand. But that's not like right out of the gate. You, you weren't like singing praise to God. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, Tell definitely us a little not. bit about that. Um, well, I definitely was not. Um, I've been fuming, mad, um, frustrated at doctors. I've gotten angry with doctors. I've argued with doctors. I've, I've punched holes in walls. You know, like I've been angry. And, um, but now I'm, I'm at, at peace. And, uh, and you weren't just angry with doctors? How did you, I mean, you were angry with God. I was just angry at the whole, the whole situation because it's such an unfixable situation. I think most men are fixers, right? Where it's like, I'm given this task and it's like, I'm either going to, if I feel like I put in the work to grind it out, then I feel like it should be fixed. Yeah. And if I, and I, I feel like it's the frustrating thing is because I put the work in every day. Like it's grinding to do in so physically, mentally, emotionally. And I feel like I put the work in, but it's like, it's like a roller coaster, right? Like it's like, there'll be another downhill slide here soon. Yeah. And so you assume you should put the work in the roller coaster will just keep going up, you yeah. know, and it just doesn't do that. And, yeah. um, so processing has been, like I said, two years, like years and, and getting in the word and not understanding it and just continual talking to people about it and just, you know, on and on. But, um, it's made my faith so real, mm. so real in that process. Um, well, it's so hopeful for me to hear you say, I was angry. Yeah. I was angry at doctors, I was angry at God, I was punching holes. Yeah. And now today, you're given testimony of your faith in the goodness of God. That's powerful. Yeah, it feels low to tell a whole church story. I mean, <laughs> I've just got a patch in my basement wall where I just... Thank you for honest, your courage. You know? Thank I mean, you. Like, it's like I was that low where I just didn't, just didn't have any answers. Well, somebody needs to hear that because they punched a hole in their wall last night yeah. and they... And they have very little hope that God's going to bring about any spiritual good in their life. They have very little hope that God's going to deliver their anger and turn it into faith. Um, so I appreciate you telling us that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we're in this sermon series in Romans 8. This is really why I wanted you guys to share is because you have suffered. And, and Paul comes to suffering in Romans 8. And he, so last week... If you weren't here last week, I gave five ways for us to wait patiently while enduring suffering. Five ways for us to wait patiently while enduring suffering. And as I'm preaching through this, I'm thinking about you guys because I think Alex and Kayla have waited patiently while enduring suffering. You haven't thrown in the towel on your faith. You've wrestled. You've, 
you've carried this, and here you are today giving testimony of God's goodness and faithfulness. What was it that resonated with you from the text of Scripture or from the sermon last week? So for me, it was in Romans 8, verse 23. And it says, As we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Um, So that touches on a few points that you made there. Um, I wrote this down on a card and put it right next to my bed just to read every morning because I think groaning was something that I was not doing and I was more bottling in and not letting myself like feel and take that inwardly. I think you voiced it as groaning being, um, can you say the deepest pain? in Groaning is... Uh, expressing to God the deepest pain Mm -hmm. from the deepest place without words. Yes. And I wish I had done that a lot sooner because I had, where I felt like I needed to groan to God and feel that was I had a really hard time watching my friends who had children Enzo's age grow up and do all the things and watching Enzo not do those things. That was the hardest thing ever. I mean, to the point where I had to literally just get off social media completely because I can't, I can't see it. I can't watch it. It was so much like comparing going on. Um, but what I needed to do was just groan to God and just feel that. Um, and then the biggest thing here is just longing for that reveal um, and knowing that the glory is greater than the suffering. There is going to be a day that Enzo's body is going to be redeemed and he will get a new body. Yes. And that's just what I hold on to. So even if it's like the worst day ever and I feel mad and I feel like I've been crying all day, remember this life is a vapor. It's gonna go by like that. Like Enzo's gonna get a new body and his life has purpose. And even if just one person comes to Jesus because of hearing Enzo's story, then it was all worth it. Mm. And that's what I hold on to. Amazing, amazing, thank you. Yeah, I, the groaning was a big one for me, and I, I played the comparison game in suffering. So, like, I look towards the Middle East, or if I was a, a person in Israel a couple of days ago, like, I, I, I view my suffering as so small. Like, I'm, I got the job I want, I live where I want to, I couldn't have, outside of Enzo, I don't, I don't suffer. And so, like, I, not taking that to God, and like she said, I would just bottle it up, and that's where you get the volcano, where I wasn't continually talking to God and groaning about it and just like getting it out and saying like this is what I feel and letting him do the work um and I've just played the comparison game of like even other special needs children where it's just like you see them they're in the hospital like well we're not that bad you know and then you start to minimize your own suffering and then that just turns into something you don't actually truly deal with because you're not actually viewing it as suffering and it and we all suffer in our own ways um and I think it has also helped me to empathize with other people's suffering because I don't know before then I, I, I had not really suffered. So I couldn't, I, you know, I feel sorry for somebody, but to truly understand what they go through and the daily battle of it, um, that's been so helpful and it helps you spread hope of Jesus too. And you can get to people on that level. Yeah. Well, if folks haven't gotten to meet Enzo. I think we have a picture of your whole family and Enzo. So there's the family. This is amazing because I love this picture because it's taken in your workplace, mm-hmm. uh, one of your workplaces, mm-hmm. which is, uh, what's the name of it? Burn Boot Camp. Sango, Sango. Burn Boot yeah. Camp. And um, so when do you teach classes here? 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., Monday through Friday. This is amazing to me because here she is feeding her child, being the feet for her child, caring for her child when she has seizures, and working our overweight butts out at, you know, 5 a.m., right? Like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Yeah, it, there's a, you, you, you want to say anything about that other than amen? I, oh, I mean, I think it's amazing because <laughs> then she goes and does four or five hours of softball lessons after yes. that, like at, at night. Yes. So you get done at eight o'clock, you put all this energy into working out. With Your kids. endurance is so yeah, inspiring yeah. to me. Your perseverance is so inspiring to me. Here's a beautiful picture of Enzo. So if you haven't met Enzo, wow, there he is. Look at that. Look at that joy. Um, what challenge do you have for our church? Um, you know, I, I, when we started the church a little over five years ago, you know, lot, lots of question marks. What, what's real life going to be? Is anybody going to commit to this thing? Are folks just going to treat it like, like a consumer and come and be here for a little while and then go on to the next new thing when it comes, you know, about? And 
when you talk about, you know, wanting Enzo to have purpose, oh my goodness. Like, you guys letting us into your lives, bringing Enzo and letting him be a part of our church, it helped us be a real church. It helped us be a real spiritual family. Um, to watch your faith endure, wrestling, endure in the midst of your suffering, it helped us become a real spiritual family. So thank you. Um, how would you challenge our church family today? A uh, challenge I give myself every day as well is um, if, if I, just in Enzo's lens, if I looked at it through the world and through my own flesh, I would be destroyed. And every day if I just said, well, his life is only going to be 10 years. It's so stupid. Why do we spend all this money and all this care for some life that's not even going to be here, you know? And, um, but my spirit tells me, well, Enzo's life has a purpose. This is what we have to do. We have to showcase it. I have to. But my point being that you have to get in the word of God mm. and you have to continually put in that input. And if you put in that input, your perspective will change on your circumstances. If you continually let the world to be your input, and something I've learned the hard way is like, it just taking all this input in from the world will get you depressed and sad. It's a sad, sinful place with limited hope. And so just to as a church to continually, I mean, get in your Bible and read it cover to cover. I'm learning a lot right now in Exodus about Come on. the Israelites. I want to preach through Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I'm, yeah. So reading about the Israelites and, the, and then relaying that to the war today. And I yeah. mean, but if you didn't know it, it yeah. would, it'd be hopeless right now. Right. But knowing that God already delivered the Israelites 2,500 years ago makes the current situation a lot different. It means yeah. a lot more hope. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, that'd be mine. Yeah. Get in God's word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So me and Alex have this saying that we say to each other on hard days, if we see the other one kind of spiraling, is we just look at each other and we'll say, BD, which means built different. BD. 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 Yes. It's built different. And I challenge that and just remind you all here today is that we're all built different. Like we all, like if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. And so we are built different and we can do hard things through Christ, like in our weakness, like he is strong. And so we are built different in that way. And so I just challenge you guys to, rem to just remind you that when you're suffering, to just remember like how strong we are with Christ. So good. And preach the gospel to yourself every day. Yeah, BD. Yeah. Well, your example is so inspiring because your, your example shouts, we are different. Mm -hmm. With the spirit of God, we can truly endure and persevere through suffering. So thankful. Church, aren't you grateful for this dear family and their, their example? So good. I want you guys to stand here and I want to invite our elders to come and to pray for you and our staff to come and pray for you. And um, after we pray for Alex and, and Kayla, um, we're going to sing, and, and um, you guys go ahead and make your way down here, and, um, and our elders, and uh, yeah, you're a softball coach, <laughs> yes, uh, you are not anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> Love you, man. Love you, bro. Um, after we pray for them, uh, we'll have an opportunity to pray for you, church. If you're suffering with an illness and you want someone to pray for you, we've anointed Enzo with oil and prayed for him and we continue to pray for his healing and confident if it doesn't come in this life, it's coming in the life to come. Um, and so if you're carrying a burden that you just need someone to pray for you, some of our elders, some of our staff will be here at the front um, as we sing this next song. Um, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. The hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Oh, Father. Father, we bless you because we see your power and your glory on display through this precious family's life. God, we give you glory because we've seen your, your life 
lived out so beautifully through Alex and Kayla. Thank you, God, for walking with them through their pain. Thank you, God, for sustaining them in their suffering. Thank you, God, for sustaining their faith and giving them a joyful testimony of your goodness in the midst of their suffering. Oh, God, we need this family. We need Enzo. We need their example, and we thank you for giving it to us, Lord. Father, we bless you. We pray today you would sustain them. God, they've given great testimony, and there may be a difficult day this week, a difficult week next month. Lord, we pray sustain them, strengthen them, embolden them, uphold them in your righteous right hands. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and for the glory of his name. Amen, amen. Church, would you give it up for this awesome couple? Stand to your feet. Let's sing out. You come and pray. If you want to pray, if you want to come and kneel at the altar, you come, you pray. Anything you're carrying, you just need someone to carry with you. You come as we sing together.